welcome to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. My name is David Godwin and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. Today we're excited to have our guest speaker Randy Swati, ecologist with the Nature Conservancy, and our guest host Jeannie Patton, the Communications Lead for the TNC Land Fire Program. Today Randy will be giving a presentation introducing the Land Fire Program and some data sets that they have developed and using some ex specific examples from the southeastern United States. Hi, everybody. Looks like we're ready to go. Thank you, David. I'm Jeannie Patton. I'm the communications lead for the TNC Land Fire team. Welcome to the first in our three-part series of webinars presented by Land Fire and the Southern Fire Exchange. Today's session is the introduction to Land Fire, which we call Land Fire 101, with Randy Swati of the Nature Conservancy's Land Fire team. I'll introduce Randy and then we'll get started. Randy received bachelor's and master's degrees at Northern Arizona U University in Flagstaff, where his scientific focus was on span spatial scales, ranging from community genetics to mycorrhizal ecology and landscape scale planning. Randy joined TNC in 2002 at the Michigan chapter, where he worked with a variety of large landowners to promote sustainable practices. He's worked to improve forest certification standards, has participated in conservation area planning and global fire assessment programs, served on TNC's Conservancy Forest Management SOP team. He joined us at Landfire in 2007. He develops vegetation models, directs workshops, and seminars, both inside and outside of the Conservancy, and works closely with academia on the use of Landfire data and products. So Randy, we can get started. It's yours. Great. Thanks, Jeannie and David. And thanks to all you participants for joining in today. I know how hard it is to find time to participate in these presentations. While I live in Michigan now, I've traveled and grew up in the southeast United States and really appreciate the challenges you guys face with storm slash, with mapping, with um, your fire adapted ecosystems, and uh, the WUI interface. So. Thanks a lot for your work and thanks for attending today. Here's sort of a bullet list of where I plan to go today. Lampfire is a huge program, so we're going to just touch, sort of skim the basics about the Lampfire data sets. But I hope it'll be enough to spark your interest to contact us to learn more. Um, all of us stand ready to help you as needed with your data questions or issues and, and modeling questions and issues as well. So thanks again, and off we go. So Lampfire is possibly an oddly named program. I work a lot in non-fire adapted ecosystems, and people tell me they don't call because of the fire title. But however, um, it is a great, amazing program, a partnership between the Department of Interior, US Forest Service, and the Nature Conservancy that delivers fire fuels and vegetation conditions, data, descriptions, models, and tools for use across the country. So I want to point out a few things here. Um, you'll see the maps. And they, they sort of serve to illustrate to you that land fire data is nationwide. It goes from coast to coast, across all ownerships, across all state boundaries. And I'm going to dig into some southeast models in a little bit. Also you'll see the, the funny box and arrow line at the bottom left, which represents the ecological models that I'll introduce as well today for your enjoyment. So more background on Landfire. It is an innovative project, as you see here. And I'll let you read that. But I'm going to point out a few things. As I mentioned earlier, Landfire is comprehensive, meaning that it, it goes across the country it, and so that is a, a huge advance, at least in my career, um, where when I came on with the Nature Conservancy, we oftentimes had data from one state, data from another state, and data from another state. And we couldn't compare them across their boundaries because of different formats or different classifications. So I really appreciate Landfire for that reason. Also, as you see there, we peri periodically update the data. And I'll go into that process in a few slides. And also, as I mentioned earlier, it's about fire, fuel, and vegetation. So regardless of your um, 
vegetation mapping needs, we may have some data for you that could be of value. So LAMFIRE is a spatial models and descriptions, tons of spatial data sets. And what I want you to focus on in a way, though, is it's a way of thinking. It's a way of trying to integrate data sets. And it's a vibrant community of users, hackers, and contributors. And when I say hackers, I mean that in the most positive way. It's a great community of kind of do-it-yourself people who are always finding new ways to address landscape planning problems through GIS, through modeling, through merging data sets. For example, you all, I'm sure, have extremely valuable data sets that you use. And so we would never suggest that LAMFIRE would be the only set of data that you might use. But you might need to merge the data sets to, to really address questions that you're grappling with. So off we go to model development. So as I mentioned earlier, the LAMFIRE program is a partnership between the Nature Conservancy, Department of Interior, and U.S. Forest Service. And the Nature Conservancy's role initially as part of this larger program was to try to understand how the vegetation of the United States would have looked prior to major European settlement. So essentially, LAMFIRE produced the country's first encyclopedia of ecosystems is sort of how I think of it. Lamfire described how the ecosystems of the U.S. looked and worked prior to European settlement. To do this, we ran dozens of workshops with hundreds of experts, um, and you, may, you guys may be some of those experts, who first described the ecosystems, then modeled the disturbances, the natural disturbances, to get an estimate of how much developmental stage or succession class will be on the landscape. These descriptions and models were then reviewed, QA, QC'd, and are available to you at the website on the bottom of the slide. We'll provide these links to you later because I know that's a lot to, to copy and follow. Here's sort of a picture of what these models look like. Using the Vegetation Dynamics Development Tool, which has since been replaced by a modeling software called STSIM, we entered in the basic parameters of the succession classes up to five, then the natural disturbance regimes and their impacts. These natural disturbances include three types of fire, wind, flooding, insects, and can also have user-defined disturbances such as beaver or beavery. These are state and transition models, that is, the boxes and arrows, that quantify rates and pathways for succession and probability of disturbance under pre-settlement reference conditions. These models are accompanied by a description document that describes the site characteristics, species, geographic range for each biophysical setting, or BPS. The models are used to estimate reference conditions for each BPS, or biophysical setting, specifically how much each succession class would be on the landscape. So I should have come up with a, a more relevant example for you, but here's, here's a graphic that may help you understand this reference condition modeling a little bit better. So we consider the western hemlock, we defined an early open tree succession class, which is down on the bottom left a closed early tree succession class, and so forth. So in the reference condition document, we would describe the height of the succession class, the tree species, and the percent cover. So that's how you get sort of the, the open and closed designation in the graph below. If a current area does not meet those mapping rules of, of height, percent canopy cover and species, then it gets an uncharacteristic label. And I apologize for the font on the uncharacteristic box. So one of the uses of these reference conditions is to compare to current conditions, which allows you to sort of get at least one metric of ecosystem health. So you'll notice in this example, um, there is a lot more of the 
closed sort of early tree succession class in this western hemlock example than you would have in the later closed tree succession class. And this is not surprising. This probably happened due to um, logging at some point for this particular biophysical setting or ecosystem. So therefore, on the landscape today, we have many more of the younger trees than we would have had historically. So another way to think about these models and descriptions. So we have a model delivery mechanism that's at landfire.gov. And you sort of drill in by hitting a vegetation tab, which you see on this, in, sort of in the middle of the screen. And then you can go in and click a map zone of interest and download the actual databases that the modeling software runs off of and the descriptions available as a PDF file. So I mentioned these model descriptions. And here's sort of what they look like, the very beginning of a description. So they're available as a PDF file. And they start out by having the information you see here. Then they go into fairly detailed description of the succession classes. And they also list off references and disturbance information. So you can learn a lot about your, your biophysical settings or ecosystems by looking at these model descriptions. And again, they represent, quote, reference conditions, not current necessarily. So in summary, and to kind of wrap up the aspatial or modeling part of the presentation today, I, I present these five bullets. And I want to um, point you to a couple um, things on here. For one, as I mentioned, the models can be hacked or modified. This is one of the beauties of, of the Landfire model, data, model set. We can go in, um, like we're doing in northern Georgia, and take those reference condition models customize them for the local landscape because these models may represent a large area and you may have had different fire or wind or herbivory regimes in the past that you need to, to sort of customize for your landscape. We can then bring those models up to the current condition. We can add in logging or invasive species or exotic pests or other modern disturbances. And then we can even launch into the future to consider which restoration regimes might best get us to our desired future conditions, whatever those might be. Also, I want to note that Landfire is not providing a prescription for how things should be today or tomorrow. We definitely realize that there's climate change, there's um, important resource extraction, and other values that, that make it to where reference conditions may not be the same as desired future condition. But we hope that they provide great context for you in a way of starting to think about and assess your landscapes. So with that, I'll take a quick stop to see if you have any questions and enter them in the chat, if you would, and I'll address them. OK, I see that no one's typing. So hopefully you are saving up some questions for me at the end. I would love to have a robust discussion as needed to clarify or hear your ideas. So now I'm going to jump into some of the spatial products or the mapping products that you may have heard of. Here's a list of the major data sets Landfire provides. There are other input data sets to these data sets that we can have access to. I'm going to point out a few of these. For example, under the vegetation heading, we have the biophysical settings data. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we described how the biophysical settings of the United States would look and work on, in those descriptions. We also have the spatial data available to map those as well. The biophysical settings concept is a bit different from the environmental setting site potential concept in that it includes disturbances. So many of you may have done or have heard of site potential mapping or habitat typing. And that would be most closely aligned to environmental site potential. And then if you were to take that and run fires or wind or other disturbances on top, you would get biophysical settings. 
Landfire also provides um, several existing vegetation type data sets, such as type, height, and cover. And many of the fire and fuel data sets, which you guys probably understand way better than I do. So with this map, I want to point out some characteristics of the data set. As I mentioned earlier, Landfire is wall to wall. And it's designed um, for use across large areas. Something we see a lot is what I would call my favorite pixel syndrome, where someone will zoom into their backyard or their favorite picnic spot and assess the data set based on, on that small area. As, as you probably can glean by now, Landfire is, is a national data set, and it's best used at large um, landscapes, such as comparing watersheds to watersheds or large parts of states to other parts of states and so on. As you try to use it at smaller and smaller scales, it requires more and more review, in my opinion. The data is delivered as 30 meter pixels. And so while it can sort of distinguish vegetation at 30 meter pixel levels, it's definitely not for use where you can actually see those pixels. The data is integrated, meaning they all, the data sets work together. Many of the attribute tables have kind of information that are similar to other attribute tables. So if you wanted to mash together existing vegetation type, cover, and height data, um, you could do that fairly simply. Or have your GIS analyst do that, which would be even simpler. So now I'm going to peruse some of the data that we have in your region. So here's a, a map of existing vegetation types. And for this map, we grouped them by the National Vegetation Classification System subclass, just to make the legend more readable or presentable for this slide. However, if you were to go in and map existing vegetation type, there would be many more in the legend. But this gives you a flavor of how they look. Um, and I can point out a few things. You'll notice that there are some, I'm going to try the arrow here, see how this works. OK. You can see areas like this. These would be map zone lines where, or physiographic lines. So these are areas where you'll want to review the data and understand the lines. But I, I'm, I wanted to show you this so you could kind of get a flavor of what the data looks like. I'm now going to go through some other data sets, including existing vegetation cover. And you'll see the legend down here. It goes in 10% increments. And this would be tree canopy cover. Next, we have vegetation height. And we, as you've probably, probably understood from my previous comments, we will sort of blend those data sets together to map current succession classes, which is on the next tab or slide. One thing to point out here, you'll see that we have succession classes A through E. They may not be in order of age of that succession class, for example. You may have succession class E range from 100 to 150 years, but be closed canopy, whereas succession class D may be 100 to 150 years, but open canopy. So you have to dig in and read the biophysical settings descriptions to make the most of this particular data set. But it, I think it's really fun to look at, and I love showing off these maps. This is a data set of historic fire regime groups. So we, you may understand that fire regime group one would be um, severe, frequent fires. And um, fire regime group five, however, would be, say, northern hardwoods or cove hardwood species that wouldn't have fire nearly as much. So any questions, please put them on the chat box. There are multiple ways to get the data. My favorite way is to download and use the Landfire Data Access Tool. And if I were you writing down anything from this presentation, this may be it. This is a, a great tool that allows you to draw a box around the landscape of interest and then basically check off from the catalog of Landfire data sets the data you want. It will import the data as zip files. Then you can click move my arrow over. You can click um, this little cog here, and then the, the tool will process the data for you. So it's really slick. 
Also, there is a Landfire Data Distribution site that's right on the homepage of landfire.gov. So if you prefer to access the data that way, you can do it. Our Landfire YouTube channel has tutorials on both methods, that should say at the bottom. So yes, please go to the Landfire YouTube channel and start checking out some of our videos there, including our tutorial on how to get the spatial data. So to summarize the spatial data set, we have dozens of 30 meter pixel raster data sets. It's designed, as you probably understand by now, for large landscape analysis. And interesting, one of the most used is the topographic data set. And I think that's because it's really fairly simple to get the landfire data and to work with it. And it does go across boundaries. So the, the data is pretty amazing that way. And it's really powerful when you couple it with your local data sets. Review the landfire data sets, make any changes that are needed, and then employ you know, the merged and amended data sets in your landscape scale analyses. So as I mentioned earlier, landfire has versions. We update our data sets. And this is another powerful sort of um, component of Landfire. And you know, I'm going to address a question um, from Berkeley uh, as you're looking at this chart, because I think it's a really great one. Um, she asks, in the map of the United States that showed the vegetation departure, what were the white areas? Great question. Those are areas that have been converted to agriculture or urban land use. So we don't convert departure there. And then um, David Godwin asked a question about the topographic data set. And honestly, I haven't used that data set, so I'm hoping someone else will chime in. Feel free. I'm not too proud um, to answer David's question in the chat box. That would be much appreciated. So Landfire refreshes the data, and then we'll be providing a total remap soon. I'll, let me describe that distinction. So the original data set is called Landfire National. That represented the ground, the landscapes, circa 2001. Okay, so you can see it took us eight years to get Landfire up and going. Huge, huge project. Then in 2001, some improvements were made and existing vegetation was refreshed. And now for 2008, 2010, and soon 2012, we'll have disturbance information succession and it, the, the existing vegetation data sets updated. So what happens is it's not a total remap. They do not go in and collect and, and spread the data across the country fresh. They go into the national data set or the previous data set. So for 2012, it would be the 2010 data set. And apply disturbance information that they get from change detection, from FIA, from plot information that you guys provide. And then update those areas to reflect the newer succession class or vegetation type. So it's really amazing to me that, that Landfire does this every two years. And then starting soon, there will be a total remap, which may employ some newer techniques and more review. So please keep your eyes peeled for that. And Landfire is always glad to get your plot data where you've done some sort of treatment or you've done some sort of survey and you have that data geo-referenced. So we would love to have that information. So here's a visual of the refresh process. This was provided by Corey of our team, Corey Blankenship. So as I mentioned, Landfire will take the national data sets, apply areas of change, data from wildfire databases, events from users such as logging, and mash that on top of um, Landfire data to then give us newer or refreshed data. So events from users um, are amazing. We have disturbance events um, for Landfire 2008 that were almost 600,000 disturbance events. So I, I'm not here to say we catch all disturbance events, especially if you um, do a, a really light overstory removal and don't provide that data, our change detection won't pick that up. 
or if um, you go in and do invasives treatment and don't report that to us, if we previously had that inf information of invasives mapped, it would still be there. So um, it is really important for you to submit plot data if you can, and it really makes our data sets better. Okay, so Lampfire also add, has added in some new areas, which may be of interest to you guys if you, if you venture in your work um, further south even. Um, we've added in the Insular Islands, which is really fun. I must admit I haven't traveled to any of those places to check out the data, but I hope to soon. Um, these new geographies were not a refresh, but they were a total new map. So that helps sort of illustrate the difference between a refresh and a remap. They, they were, it was not possible to do a refresh because there wasn't previous data. Those new areas get new maps based on 2010 imagery. So as I've mentioned, um, we really value your plot data. Also, we have several processes underway in which we'll be calling you for input. For example, um, our team is starting a review of those biophysical settings, models, and descriptions, and we would really value your input on those as we, we aim to clean them up and improve them. As I mentioned, I, I see them as a first encyclopedia of ecosystems, and we might throw in the word first draft, although they weren't first drafts. Um, they can definitely be improved, and we, we value your input there. Also, the plot data you can kind of see here. We have areas of the country that have less plot data. Um, yay, Florida. You've submitted a fair bit. Southern Louisiana. And so this really helps us make our data sets better. So in terms of landfire data use, excuse me, sorry, I was overactive there with the slide advance. We have um, a, a really amazing set of stories and peer-reviewed journal articles and, and other resources that help you understand how people are using LANFAR data. One particular tool is named, my, my favorite acronym, the WAM, Web Hosted Applications Map, that you'll find at maps.tnc.org slash LANFIRE. You can click on those buttons, and they're mostly non-FIRE uses of LANFIRE. We're working on building up our, our database and possibly a map of fire uses. Those fire uses of land fire are largely collected on our conservation gateway, which will be introduced momentarily. So please check out the WAM, submit plot data, go to the websites that Jeannie will be introducing momentarily, um, provide us feedback on land fire products, good and bad, we can use it all. And um, I really appreciate your participation today. Next, Jeannie will introduce a couple of resources for you, and then we'll, we'll hopefully take tons of questions from you. I'll do my best to answer them and post them in the chat box, and we can all dig into them and get answers for you. So thanks a lot. And um, as I mentioned, we have tons of resources, and I'm going to let Jeannie take it away here to introduce the Conservation Gateway. Thanks, Randy. And it might go back to you. I'm not sure. Conservation Gateway is the Nature Conservancy's website for all users. Nature.org is the conservancy that really is reaching a general public with conservancy news worldwide. The Gateway mainly are talking back and forth with scientists, with project managers, with professionals in the field. On the Conservation Gateway is our land fire site. And it's really, uh, we've been developing it over three or four years now, and it's becoming broader and deeper in terms of our offerings and resources for you. We're continuing to add more to it. It's a pretty dynamic place. So quickly, you can get information, as you can see from the left drill, models and spatial data, support. There's several drill downs under that in terms of FAQs. Uh, do you need to talk to one of us? Do you need tutorials? Uh, what do you need, essentially, from us? We're very easy to reach. Applications, we look at summary stories there, little thumbnail looks at uh, how people are using land fire tools and data across the country, um, maybe some ideas about where you might be able to use them and where you can get some help. Maps GIS is both static and interactive. You'll find the WAM especially listed there, but we have also put 
or connections to and systems that we find really valuable that we use. So you might want to look through there. Library's got about an eight section drill down. It does include bibliography. We try to put as much in there as we can. It is by no means comprehensive. If you take a look at the library and you see something we're missing, or if you want to pull something out of the library, I'm the librarian, and I'm glad to help you with that. News and updates, this is where we just send out what's happening this week, this month, our bulletins, and that sort of thing. And then the contact page is actually a page unto itself, where you can reach each of us individually and get some background information on us. You'll also get the contact information there for fire at tnc.org, our email address, which is a place where you can always get information from us. The HTTP address, nature.ly.landfire, is where you can find us on the Conservation Gateway. As Randy has said, Landfire is a huge repository. It's a living program, a community that delivers the five bullets, reference conditions and models, vegetation, fire fuels, dozens, if not hundreds, of research and other papers. I'd go hundreds. Tutorials, documentation, adaptation, updates, and I'll just repeat that the Landfire team, the TNC Landfire team, and the Landfire Help Desk at landfire.gov are really good spots for you to begin. If you need more information on this or refresh um, information that you've already got, or if you want to talk with any of us in terms of your planning, uh, we're glad to talk with you about that. Next is the Fire Exchange series on October 10th. We're going to look at assessing needs, and longtime Landfire collaborator Jennifer Costanza, I think Jennifer's on the call today, PhD from North Carolina State, is going to present an overview of how to use Landfire data to examine restoration needs in the southeast. She's focusing in now on what particular project we're going to take a look at there, and as We've already said before, look at your newsletters and email. And as soon as we have that information, we'll be sending it out. And then again, either end of October or early November, our, the final in our three-part series, Customizing Data. Uh, we've got a few people who are interested in presenting case studies about how data were adapted to meet their specific local needs. The bit.ly address that you have here is wonderful. It's good to have. You're not going to memorize it. There are other ways that you can get this information. One of them is to look at the presentation again, but here are the best ways you can catch us online daily. Landfire National is at landfire.gov. Those are our federal partners who are working the project in the big scheme. That's where the tools and data reside. We are the Conservation Gateway. This is where the Nature Conservancy sits. We, of course, work in cooperation with Landfire National, so you will hopefully complement each other. Our gateway I, th I think of as a good entry point to get information that you need. Landfire.gov is highly technical. That's where you can get the tools. We tweet daily. Our Twitter uh, feed is at nature underscore landfire. Please join us. Uh, and I know Southern Fire has a Twitter account as well. We try to get information out there daily. Um, on YouTube, we have a YouTube channel. The keyword is landfire. The better way to reach us is Landfire Video, all one word. If you just plug in Landfire, you're going to get all kinds of crazy things. And then our email address, landfire at tnc.org. I saw from the poll at the beginning that most of you heard about this uh, presentation, this series, through email. And I know David's email has been very active, sending out newsletters, etc. We have an email list as well. If you would like to be included in our mailing list, where we do send out bulletins, news releases, etc., no spam, no filler, only solid information that you might be able to use, drop me a note at landfire.tnc.org, and I'll get you onto our mailing list. So this is my end of the conclusion here. Our team is five, Jim, Corey, Randy, Sarah, and me. You can connect with any one of us, as I've mentioned, through our uh, contacts page on our gateway, always through landfire at tnc.org. That line about newsletter, just ask as a reminder. Just drop me a line if you'd like to get it, um, into our mailing list. I'd like to turn this over now to David and back to Randy, and we can handle any questions or comments that you have. All right. Thank you, Jeannie. And thanks, Randy, for that uh, outstanding presentation. Uh, 
Did you guys, did anyone else have any questions? I saw that you were able to address some of the questions in the chat room while Jeannie was, was uh, wrapping things up there. Anyone else have any other questions for Randy? Hopefully yes, you're no. still there, Randy. Yes, um, thanks to all of you for participating and thanks there, Jeannie. Jeannie just kind of picked up the ball at an unplanned place because of the thunder and lightning on my end, so <laughs> thanks, Jeannie, for that. Um, and, and two great questions came up, and it looks like a couple more are coming in. Um, those biophysical settings, descriptions, and models were um, you know, completed by experts who tried to use the best local information that they had, whether it be peer-reviewed literature or um, general land office survey information or um, um, local tree ring work, whatever we could find to to kind of bolster those models we would use. That said, as you review the models, you'll note there are some ecosystems that we just didn't know as much about. Um, and so I, I, I always encourage you to review and think about those descriptions and look at the reference list and see if it matches what you would expect to see. I know in my world we have Great Lakes Alvar ecosystems, for example, that just haven't been studied as much as maybe the red pine, white pine ecosystems. Also, I wanted to clarify an answer I made earlier um, in the text box. In, in the War Woman and, and many other land, or some other landscapes in the Appalachians, we are taking the land fire reference condition models and sort of customizing them. And those models are, are going to be really useful to us because they have even more refinement for those areas. And um, it is possible for us to share those with you. However, I have to say that they are drafts and maybe delivery is sort of pending review by the people who helped us with those. So um, I'll, I'll be happy to connect anyone with the models we've developed and with the people who developed them and they can kind of throw in the fine print as needed um, to make those kind of make the most sense. Okay, so <laughs> another question from Alan regarding work with the development of the new Southern Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal. So um, some of the, the people who work on the risk assessments across the country were former land fire participants. So I think that's where some of those, those connections come in. And honestly, Alan, I don't know how, how um, deep that connection goes with the Southern Wildfire Risk Assessment. I will have to look into that and get back to you, which I'm happy to do. I know that they use some of the land fire data sets, but not all. And um, I, I, that's a great question I'll look into. Note to self, any other questions? I had a great question, Randy. Um, yes. You, you sort of solicited feedback from, from managers on, um, on disturbances in their areas to, to try and update the data set. What kinds of things are you looking for? Because of the refresh interval, are you interested in things like prescribed fires in the southeast? Um, because our fire turn interval is so frequent in many cases, um, is that something that you want to catch uh, in the refreshes? Or are you, in the southeast, are you really interested in things like um, timber harvests or uh, high severity fires where the, the vegetation return uh, might take a little bit longer? Could you talk about that? Yes, yes, that's a great question. You know, it was interesting as we did the first um, round of land fire because some of the mappers, they did not believe us when we told them the fire return intervals of your ecosystems in Florida. Um, they just, they didn't believe it. And so I, I really appreciate your question because it, it took a lot of work to convince them that, yes, um, things change very quickly in your part of the world. Um, so we would appreciate any sort of disturbance information, so, so your prescribed fire boundaries um, and, and effects, if you have them and you have the time to submit, a, submit them to land fire, that would be very useful. Also, any sort of logging, whether it's um, clear cuts or single tree selection, um, we, we appreciate that and can use it. We have what's called the veg vegetation transition database that will help us take your data and transition what may have formerly been a closed canopy pine forest into what's now an open canopy pine forest with your plot data. So that, that would be great. 
And so, so that, that helps. So then I guess my next follow-up question to that is when or if managers uh, supply this information on the different disturbances in their areas um, to improve the land fire data set, is that going to be incorporated into the current data that's available on the website now, or, are, or is that information only going to be factored into the next refresh? Great question. Yes, next refresh. Okay. Once the data is delivered, it's sort of there. That's that's that, and um, that's why it's you know it's it's great that we have these two-year intervals now because we had to before the first refresh, there were more years in between, and so we weren't able to catch some of the the changes. But yes, it would be every two years, and it's only going to be applied to the newer data sets. All right. Well, thank you so much, Randy, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you and, and Jeannie on getting. Uh, this webinar put together today. You bet. Thank you. Mm -hmm.